Welcome to this revision zone video on Kinetics 2 and we'll be looking at working out the activation energy using the Arrhenius equation. So what should we know so far? Now in regards to the Kinetics 2 topic you will have already covered the rate equation at this point and in our previous videos. Now we know that the rate equation shows how the rate changes when you change particular concentrations of the components within the reaction itself. So we know that the concentration changes the rate of reaction shown by the following rate equation. Now this rate equation has a rate constant, okay? And concentrations of A and B in this case, these are the reactants found within the rate determining step or in the reaction itself. And they're raised by some power and those powers we know are orders. So we know concentration affects the rate of reaction. We know that as the concentration increases, so as the concentration increases, we know that the rate is affected in some way. That might mean that it's times by the same factor increase as the concentration, um, or it has no effect at all, or it has a quadrupling effect. Um, and that's all to do with the orders. So if you're not sure on what the orders are, it would be a good opportunity to go back and review orders. So we know that we have orders of reaction, zero, first, and second. And this tells us how any change in concentration of A or B affects the rate. However, we should know, even from GCSE, that things like temperature, surface area, and the addition of catalyst affects the rate of reaction. Now, we know from the rate constant that the rate constant is only affected by temperature. So temperature is the only thing that really affects this rate constant. So I'm just going to highlight this. It's really quite important that we, we remember this, that temperature is the only thing that affects the rate constant. So at a particular temperature, K will be constant, but as soon as you start changing that temperature, K will change. So essentially you increase the temperature, K will also increase. So we know that the temperature will affect the rate in some way. That means that a higher temperature means a higher rate. And this is what I just mentioned a little bit earlier, is that K is also proportional to the rate and temperature also affects K. So there is some kind of relationship between these two variables. So i.e. there's a relationship between temperature and rate, temperature and rate constant, rate constant and rate. So that's all really quite important. But that relationship between temperature and activation energy, which is what we are going to be looking at here, is an exponential relationship. And we can use these other variables like um, rate constant um, to help us determine what that relationship is. So there is an exponential relationship between temperature and activation energy, and we're going to utilize that to help us work out the activation energy. So how are all of these related? So how is K, temperature, and activation energy related? And it's all related together or put together by the Arrhenius equation. This gives you the relationship between all three of them. The following is the Arrhenius equation, something that you do need to know, but more importantly, you need to know the manipulation of this, which we'll again look at later. The temperature must be in Kelvin here, and that's again something I'll, I will highlight again. The other thing worth highlighting here is this little negative. You've got to remember that negative's there because it's going to be quite important again later on. So let's try and put this all into some context. Now, from year one kinetics, you will have come across Maxwell distribution, Maxwell Boltzmann distribution curves, I should say. So here's a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution curve. You can see there's relatively quite, well, quite a few lines there. Um, and each of those lines represent a Maxwell distribution curve at a particular temperature. And if we just focus on the red line here, and that's the one that's probably the, the flattest out of all of them, that's at 1000 Kelvin. 600 Kelvin is actually this lilac line that runs, and then 300 Kelvin for the blue, and 100 Kelvin for the turquoise color there. And we can see that if we go from 100 to 1,000, that this line gets flatter and kind of shifts across this way. And we also need to know another bit of information. That other bit of information is the fact that we have 
and activation energy. Okay, so that is your energy of activation. This is the energy, this is your threshold at which particles must have at minimum this energy or above. So any particles within this area of the curve will have energy equal to or above the activation energy, i.e. going on to give a successful reaction or successful collision, I should say. Right, so there is a relationship between this whole Boltzmann, Maxwell Boltzmann curve and the energy of activation because they both appear on there. So there must be a relationship with, between the number of particles that have energy equal to or above the activation energy. So that relationship is that this area under the curve that you can see that I've highlighted in red, this area here, is proportional or equivalent to this part of the Arrhenius equation. So the e to the power of minus ea over rt, that's given in this part of the Arrhenius equation. So there is a relationship between this equation and a Maxwell-Boltzmann curve. It should be pretty obvious in the sense that if you have more particles with energy equal to or above the activation energy, you're going to get a higher rate of reaction. Remember, we said that the rate is proportional to the rate constant. So the proportion underneath this curve or the area under this curve, the number of particles equal to or above that activation energy will have some effect on the rate constant. And obviously, this also illustrates that as you increase temperature, that that proportion or that area under the curve equal to or above the activation energy will affect the rate of reaction or the rate constant. It's also worth mentioning at this point that, you know, adding a catalyst, we know, uh, moves this, this threshold further down and lowers the activation energy. So it also has a relationship to K and will affect K if you add um, a catalyst in. So let's have a look at each of the components with the Arrhenius equation. So what I've done is I've just broken the Arrhenius equation down and we're going to look at each of the components, any units where appropriate and what the value actually means. So the first one is the rate constant itself. And remember it's proportional to rate and we'll be using, utilizing that bit of information uh, when we go to analyze and try and actually calculate the activation energy. As you've probably already been told that it's sometimes difficult to measure the rate directly of a reaction and sometimes we use values that are proportional to the actual rate in terms of moles per decimeter cube per second. So i.e. 1 over t, so 1 over time uh, is proportional to the rate and that will be a useful thing to remember when we look at this later on. The next one is the Arrhenius constant, so the capital A in our equation here. Okay, so that is sometimes referred to as the pre-exponential factor. Now, it's worth remembering that because in exam questions, sometimes you are expected to work out the pre-exponential factor, which again, we'll look at uh, later on, but i.e. it just means working out the Arrhenius constant. Now, the Arrhenius constant, if you're wondering what that is, not something you really need to worry about. It's the fraction of molecules that would have energy greater than or equal to the activation energy, where the, the um, activation energy has a zero kilojoules per mole value or joules per mole value. So that just kind of almost gives us a reference point for how many particles actually do have energy equal to above the actual activation energy. So if you're wondering what that is, not, not something you'll be asked, but if you're wondering, that's what it refers to. E, we should know, is just some exponential factor. It's a constant. If you do maths, you'll know exactly what that number is, I guess. If not, you just need to know where it is in your calculator. And a lot of this calculation is about knowing where the buttons are in your calculator to work out the values you need to work out. EA, quite obvious, it's energy of activation or energy, uh, activation energy. Now, the units here, a lot of people, and I've mentioned this prior in the video, kilojoules per mole, the actual unit of energy of activation here from the Arrhenius equation is given as joules per mole. So try and remember that that is joules per mole, not kilojoules per mole. So your final answer, when we look at this calculation, will actually look quite big. It will look in like the tens of thousands even. So be prepared to calculate that as kilojoules per mole by dividing by a thousand. R you should recognize as the real gas constant. Always use the value that they give you. If they don't give you something, I tend to suggest that you use 8.314. Uh, 
And remember the units, joules per Kelvin per mole. That's really quite important. And lastly, as mentioned before, capital T, temperature must be in Kelvin. It's not a change in temperature that we're using here. It is an actual temperature and therefore we must use the SI units for temperature, which is Kelvin. So if we look back at the Maxwell Boltzmann curve, we know that as we increase the temperature, that area under the curve increases that is above the activation energy. So therefore, it really just says that you have a higher temperature, you have more particles. So if we look at an energy profile diagram, so, so this is an exothermic and I've labeled in the energy of activation um, within the, the actual profile diagram. You can imagine that what we're going to do experimentally is we're going to use the change in temperature to work out roughly where this activation energy is. Now, it's not a, something that I would want anyone to describe it in an exam as that's what we're doing. But the idea is if you're trying to get your head around what we're trying to do is that we're trying to work out, right, if I have a low temperature, I'm not going to have many particles that will be able to get over the activation energy. If I use start using a higher temperature, I might have uh, more particles. Well, I will have more particles that have energy equal to or greater than the activation energy. And I just keep doing that at various different temperatures. And I work out approximately where this activation energy is by using all these different temperatures. And that's not, if you're trying, I hope that helps, but if it doesn't, don't worry about it. The idea is, is that the Arrhenius equation is the main thing that you need to understand, which gives us the activation energy and relates these three components together. So what do I need to do or what do we need to do in order to work out the energy of activation from the Arrhenius equation? Well, it needs some manipulating first. Fortunately, the manipulation is quite easy, especially if you do A-level maths. If you don't, I would suggest that you just learn um, that last equation that you will need to utilize. However, in within the video, I do try and go through some explanations as to how we get there. So what's the relationship between K and temperature? So K is the rate constant here. Temperature is up here in the indices part, and it's raised to that power with the base number being E. So there is an exponential relationship between temperature and rate constant. I've just roughly drawn an exponential curve here. It's not perfect by any means, but the idea is there's an exponential relationship. Now, this isn't very useful to us. So what we need to do is I need to get rid of that exponential factor. Uh, and by doing that, we need to do something, uh, and that is take the inverse function of E, which is natural logs, which is the next thing I'm going to have a look at now. So we're going to have a look at manipulating an Arrhenius equation. Now, like I just mentioned before, that exponential curve isn't very useful to us. So what do I need to do in order to make it more useful? Well, I need to do the inverse function as mentioned, and the inverse function is natural logs. Now, natural logs, um, if you, you're familiar, is given by the term ln um, on your calculator. And like I said before, for majority of you, you will only need to know where this button is if you don't do A-level maths. But at this point, I am going to just go through what are logs or natural logs in a very brief way. If you're absolutely happy with those, it may be worth skipping ahead in the timestamp to the, the next part. Otherwise, it may be worth listening to this. So logs are inverse functions to allow you to work out the indices when given the base number. So I, I've, got, I've got a few examples here. We'll work through each one at a time. So starting off with these two examples, you can see. So if we look at the one on the left here, so I've got a, uh, a an equation here, two to the power of x is equal to eight. Now, I'm sure many of you will know that that is gonna be, x is gonna be three straight away. So, because we know two cubed is eight. But the idea is logs allow you to work out x itself, the actual power it's being raised to, this base number here. So log is the inverse, so we have log to the base two. Now on your calculator, usually uh, scientific calculators at least anyway, this is already pre-programmed as log to the base 10, not two. Um, so like this, and they won't show you the little 10 there, they'll just give you the log button. That might change as, as time goes on, that the scientific calculators you're able to change these base numbers or have options for other ones, but at this moment in time, to my knowledge, it's always log to the base 10, which is still useful nonetheless. Right, so I basically punch in, if you've got a graphical, you go log to the base two, 
eight, and that will give me an answer three. And you can have a go at that now. Uh, pause the video, run it through your calculator, just so that you know you're happy with that answer. Now, the next one is log to base 10, but as mentioned, uh, that's probably the one you'll see on your calculator. You'll see this button. So if you're ever wondering what that was, that's you now know what it means. Now, so it's log to the base 10. And if I've got 10 to the power of X is equal to 100, well, we know that's 10 squared is 100. But if we put it in a calculator, log 100, we should get uh, our two value. Okay, so we should get this two value here. So what are natural logs? Well, natural logs are quite simply just log to the base e so where this would be e not 2 where this would be e not 10 and we say that log to the base e is natural log so i.e if you just have a look at this next example natural logs are log to the base e and we say that log to the base e okay is ln and that's again a button you will find on your scientific or graphical calculator and what you do is, let's say we've got e to the x is equal to 2.76. I haven't actually calculated this. You don't find log e on your calculator. You find ln and you put 2.76 in and that will give you x. But the idea is that's what a natural log is. So I hope that was, it's a very brief overview of what logs are, but uh, hopefully it was useful. So let's try and use that explanation of logs or natural logs in calculating um, our activation energy, which is this part of our Arrhenius equation. So in order to remove the E, I need to take natural logs of both sides. So remember, when I take natural logs of this side, there are two components here that are worth kind of highlighting, if you like, this bit here and the Arrhenius constant itself. And we're going to take natural logs of both of these. So what you end up with, and I'm going to just show this partially. So we end up with natural log of the rate constant is LNK. That is equal to the natural log of A. So that's that first component there. And remember, when we take natural logs of this part, we're going to remove the E. So this drops down and we won't actually see LN written here. We'll just see the, get rid of that, uh, EA over RT. Okay, so that is the equation that you really need to be familiar with and learn and it is much more useful to use this equation so let's have a look at why that format is much more useful so if we have a look at the equation that i've written before it's in this format here l and k natural log of the arrhenius constant minus and that's really quite important minus ea over rt so that was that that power that we remove the base number E from. So why is that useful? Why is that more useful? Well, it's shown it in a Y equals MX plus C format. And that means I can draw a graph uh, using this equation of two variables, which we'll discuss in a moment, and use this Y equals MX plus C, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, and draw a graph and work out its gradient and it will essentially give me the activation energy. There is a little bit of manipulation required at that point, but it's really quite simple. So let's have a look at how we can draw this graph. So first of all, it might be worthwhile just switching these two terms around. So you move this term to the front and this uh, natural log A. So not the, it's no longer the pre-exponential factor. It's had natural log, so the inverse of that which is e, e to the power of this entire thing would give you the pre-exponential factor, the Arrhenius constant. But let's say I switch these two around such that you get minus ea over rt plus ln over a. I'm oh, sorry, not L, over a, ln a. So how is that related to y equals mx plus c? So y equals mx plus c, I've just written it as close to uh, lining all these variables up as I can, where x is the variable 1 over t. Okay, so if I look at this particular component here, if I was to remove 1 over t from that, okay, I'd end up with minus Ea over R times 1 over t plus LNA. Then I have M, my M is therefore equal to minus EA over R. So let's just have a look at this. I'll try and highlight exactly what part's what. So the M 
is this part. The x is this part. And my constant is that part. That's the intercept of the y-axis. So wherever my line intercepts the y-axis, the axis is natural log a. And then I do e to the power of that intercept, and it will give me the pre-exponential factor. But again, we'll look at this in one of the questions in the, the next video. So ln k, remember ln k is there as well. That's my y value. So in fact, I'm just going to use a different color here. Okay, so that's my next variable. So essentially what I'm going to do is I'm going to plot a graph. I've done this experiment and I've got the data, which I'm going to discuss next, of y and x variables, which we're given in this equation. So essentially ln k versus a one over temperature graph. So experimentally, this is useful. Why? Because I can measure the rate of reaction. And remember what I said earlier, K, the rate constant, is proportional to the rate of reaction. So as that increases, the rate will increase in some way. Okay. I can measure the rate of reaction at a given temperature. Okay. So remember, K is proportional to the rate and therefore is also proportional to 1 over T. I mentioned this earlier. So 1 over T is 1 over time. And that is essentially the unit there is per second. That means I know that my natural log of K from over here, so I've just written it here, is proportional to the natural log of one over T. So experimentally, it's a lot easier sometimes just to measure the time taken for a reaction to get to a certain point. And that certain point is, well, you need to look back at the initial rate method uh, in order to have an understanding of that. But the idea is, is that we use the initial rate method to measure the time taken to get to a certain volume of gas produced, a certain concentration. And we say that that is proportional to the rate at a particular concentration. And in this case, a particular temperature. Um, so we know that these two. So when you see exam questions, you may well see rather than K, one over T, you are expected to know that these two are equivalent and proportional to each other. So but the the manipulation is exactly the same. How we use it is exactly the same. It differs in no way. So now that I have these two counterparts, one over T, so natural log one over T, and obviously a temperature, my X variable, remember that's my independent variable. That's the variable that I'm changing, one over T, okay? I can collect my data in a table, which I'll show you again in the next video of how we tabulate that. Um, to to draw a graph so we use these two sets of variables and draw a graph now i'm going to try and show you a graph so let's move this up a tad so the graph will look something like this now my lnk or ln1 over t which is the y-axis here will usually give me a negative value and we expect to see a graph on this negative quadrant my one over temperature one over T temperature is always on the x-axis and that will go up this way. And then when I plot the data, there's a few things I need to discuss on these axes in a moment, but I should get a straight line, which is a negative, which has a negative gradient. Now that's really important. important. It has to have a negative gradient. It has to have a negative gradient because my M from my y equals MX plus C equation is negative also, which means that gradient, negative gradient, will cancel out that negative there, and I can work out the activation energy. So hopefully with that, you can start to picture how we're gonna actually work out the activation energy. However, there's a few things. No, no units for the y-axis, no units. And obviously per Kelvin for the units on the x-axis, and you'll notice that I've written times 10 to the minus three here. Now. Temperature in Kelvin will tend to be in the hundreds, you know, 100, 200, 300, and so on. And if you do one over that, it's um, it's a 10,000th, I hope that's right, 10,000th uh, roughly um, uh, value. Sorry, not 10,000th, 1,000th. It's a 1,000th value. So um, we end up with quite small numbers is what I'm trying to say. So rather than writing 0 0.00372, we can just write... 3.72 times 10 to the minus 3 in our table. Now, at this point, it's up to you how you utilize that data. And again, I'll, I'll look at this in the next video in regards to how we use that. But rather than using uh, 0 0.00372 and trying to plot these or put the scale on here 
at such small values. I can just write, for instance, uh, let's assume it starts from zero, it doesn't need to, go one, two, three, four, five. But by writing times 10 to the minus three here, that actually means 1.0 1. 1. times 10 to the minus three, 2.0 times 10 to the minus three, 3.0 times 10 to the minus three, and so on. So that should help you plot your points on the graph a lot more, much easier, ma makes it a lot easier, I would say. But you need to be careful when you are calculating the gradient and you take this into consideration when doing it. And again, that's something that I will look at later on in the next video. So let's have a quick overview of actually how to calculate the gradient and what the gradient is e equivalent to. Now we know from uh, previous parts in this video that the gradient is equal to minus Ea over R, the real gas constant being R. And again, remember the units joules per Kelvin per mole. So the gradient will also be negative. Uh, so that negative that we've got there will cancel out. You cannot have a negative activation energy. So never ever write down as your final answer minus whatever at 10,000 joules per mole is equal to the Ea. That's not not correct. So it shouldn't have a, just don't put a sign in front of it to be fair. The sign will be positive, but you don't need to put a sign unless it specifically asks for that sign. So I know that the gradient is equal to minus E, minus Ea, sorry, over R. So if I times both sides by minus R, I end up with Ea. Now what I've done is I've just put some rough markings in this graph, not great markings, but rough markings nonetheless. And I remember I've put times 10 to the minus three here. So I'm just gonna go 1.00 times 10 to the minus three, 2.00, 3.00, 4.00, 5.00. So if I go and do my uh, reaction at different temperatures and I do one over T and I find that it's one, my first reaction is um, works out one over T is 1.00 times 10 to the minus three, then I that is what I would essentially plot here. However, let's say I've got this straight line. I'm just going to use my two points to calculate my gradient as per usual. So I am just going to make my life a little bit easier and I'm just gonna use the kind of whole values here. So what I've done is I've just marked in those points and I've put some dashed lines in to say where they line up with on the X axis and the Y axis. Now I'm just gonna add my numbers on the Y axis here. Again, it's just rough, um, it's nothing exact here, but I know that these are negative. So I'm just gonna go for minus 1.00, minus 2.00 and so on all the way down. Now you can see my scales are not perfect by any means, but for this purpose, that's irrelevant. But obviously when you do it graph graphically, you've got to make sure that your scales are evenly done and an appropriate scale at that. So I can see, I'm gonna say that this first part of the, where the, this brown, first brown line intersects the, uh, not intercept, sorry, where it cuts the Y axis and where it cuts it, where, it, where the value is, um, I'm going to just say that's minus 1.50 and this one's minus 4.00 at the bottom here. So I know now basically know my coordinates of these two points that I'm going to use to draw my gradient. So let me go and draw our typical triangle to work out gradient. There we go. So I want to make sure they're dashed lines because then it's not part of the graph. So let me just make those dashed lines. I now need to work out the difference between the change in Y and divide that by my change in X. And that's really quite important. So let me go and write those values in. Now, this is typically what you see. So I've got minus 3.50 between these two points on my Y axes. It's going from minus one and a half to minus 4.00. And then I'm going from 1.00 to 3.00. Now, I've purposely done this you can see that I've only written 2.00 here, but you've got to remember that is times 10 to the minus three. So this really should be written as 2.00 times 10 to the minus three. Okay, so that's really important. And that's what students tend to forget. Quite often they just ignore, the, or not necessarily ignore, they forget about the times 10 to the minus three and don't incorporate it in their gradient. Now I know that the gradient is equal to my change in Y over change in X. 
and my change in y is minus 3.50, so that's how my gradient becomes negative. And I'm going to divide that by my 2.00 times 10 to the minus 3. And that comes out as, you can see that I haven't put a unit here and I want to discuss that unit now. We know that this unit for the x-axis is per Kelvin. And there are no units for the y-axis. So if I want to work out the unit for this, it would essentially be no unit. So divided by per Kelvin. Let's give no unit the value of one and per Kelvin at the bottom. Now with fractions and solving fractions, this basically gives the unit K for the gradient. So the gradient has a unit of K. It's really quite important. I've seen that on exam questions before. They said give the unit of your gradient. So calculate the gradient and give the unit and you've got to remember that unit is K, but you can work it out if you, as long as you've got all the appropriate units were correct on the x-axis and obviously understand there's no units there. Otherwise, it may be a good thing just to remember. So how do I use this minus 1750 Kelvin and get the activation energy? Well, it's exactly what we've got written here. I'm going to times it by minus 8.314. So my gradient, I'm just going to write it along underneath this actually. So we go minus 1750 times by minus 8.314 and that will give me that will give me my activation energy in joules per mole because remember the units for r well i'll give the value 8.314 joules per kelvin per mole and the unit of my gradient is k and if i times that by joules per kelvin per mole it removes the kelvin so it ends up becoming or given the following value, 14,549.5 joules per mole. But remember, typically in chemistry, we like values in kilojoules per mole. So you may be asked to give it as kilojoules per mole. You just divide by 1,000. I would also look at whether the question is asking me to do it to a certain accuracy. It could be one decimal place, three significant figures. Usually it's three or even two. Just keep be mindful of that. Or look at the table if you're AQA especially have a look at um, the table that you have data that you're given and what accuracy they've given it to you. So typically it's three significant figures. So you'd want to give this three significant figures. And that's what I'm going to do here. And that's your final answer for the activation energy. So this is the first end of the first part of the video. Uh, the second part goes through actual application of the manipulation of Arrhenius equation, which we've looked at here, plotting graphs, and getting the gradient and calculating the activation energy from that in the next part. I hope this video has made sense and it's useful. If you're, if you're finding it useful, please hit the sub button and subscribe and like the video. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you for watching.